everyone. Welcome. I'm Jessica Zartler with The Common Stack here for another edition of the Trusted Seed Spotlight. We are so lucky and happy to welcome Simon De La Rivière this week, who is a Common Stack advisor. And could, could we say you're the inventor of bonding curves or... Uh, you could say that. Uh, it was partly a simultaneous invention, but I uh, also, you know, stood on the giants of other people that have done research in this space. So I, I made a decent contribution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And like the noosphere, all the ideas come to us from somewhere else. And also who ha uh, is the author of this fantastic book called Hope Runners of Gridlock that I am currently reading. So we'll get into that in just a little bit. But first, Simon, tell us about you. How did you end up down this rabbit hole and where did you where did you grow up? Yeah, um, so I am South African, uh, currently residing in Cape Town. I, I grew up in the uh, area around here. Um, I got into this industry um, due to the fact that it's that it's um, it signaled to me a lot of potential to empower creatives. Um, I'm a creative myself. In, in many different ways, creative music, uh, art, uh, writing. Um, I also enjoyed dancing. And so anything to do with creative expression, I adore. And a part of that was always the problem of like, how do we see more of this in the world? Uh, and, and how do we empower each other? And it started with me. Um, I created games in high school and I really enjoyed it, but I had no avenue or channel to sell my games. Um, you know, I was a teenager and in South Africa. And at that point in time, there was like dial up. It's the only way to access the internet. And there was no way to do any e-commerce for someone that wanted to just, you know, sell their games they made in the afternoons after school. Um, and so that, that was where like the start of the frustration came from the fact that I felt like I couldn't access opportunity due to the fact that I was just, you know, born in South Africa. Um, and as a result of that, I, I, you know, started coding, I started doing websites. And then finally, when Bitcoin came around in, in 2011, I, would, I was just fascinated by this entire system and what it could present that um, I finished up my university studies. And then soon after I jumped head over heels and with everything I have um, into the entire space. And so I started just building things to empower creatives. So I've done stuff from uh, the music industry to inventing new economics like um, bonding curves and helping to design the ERC20 token standard um, and just talking about the stuff a lot, uh, perhaps to the detriment of friends and family. Um, but I also just enjoy writing about it and sharing the ideas. So yeah, that's 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 where I am today. I'm still excited about the potential and that's what I'm still doing today, working at this intersection of the creative economy and blockchain technology. You make it sound so effortless and easy, but you know, when you're approaching a challenge like this that's at the systemic level and you know, you're looking for solutions. What's your process? I, I mean, I look at you as one of the most kind of out of the box thinkers in our ecosystem and our community. So do you have like a particular process when you approach a problem? Is it pretty much emergent or what do you draw on when you're looking at um, how to kind of create a new path or maybe a hack to get from here to there more quickly or? That is a very good question. It is something <laughs> I had not actually given much thought. I need to introspect on that. Um, but I would say I would say the the biggest factor is um, to to like not shy away from from exploring certain avenues. I think I think something that I've enjoyed a lot in everything that I've done is I've been I I am I've always been very curious and I enjoy understanding systems. So you know whether that's from you know figuring out, asking questions like, how does the traffic light figure out when to switch over to a different <laughs> like thing? Or like, how does eleva how do elevators work if there's three elevators in a building? You know, these are the questions I ask myself when I'm just bored and, I, <laughs> and I, I, I just find these questions everywhere. And then I go down these rabbit holes to find the answers. Um, and I think that's helped me a lot in, in, in 
developing a kind of process is to is to look at everything and see how the system works and then finding all the knobs and gears that you can potentially turn to improve things but often sometimes in that process we are looking to turn the gears and knobs to just give marginal improvement sometimes you stumble upon a very new room with a lot of new exploration i always enjoy this metaphor from um it was a book written by Stephen Johnson called um, It's About Innovation. I don't recall the names, but about, innova about innovation. And in it, um, there's a quote by, I think it was Stuart Kaufman, who had this quote, which is this, this definition of the adjacent possible, the innovation that is just next door. And they use a metaphor of like, there's a door. And when you open the door, there's a new room. And the adjacent possible is just like open, op just opening these doors and looking what's there. But what's great about that metaphor is that sometimes when you open a room, it's not a small closet, it is a giant hole. And that's sometimes what it feels like. You're sometimes just poking around and opening doors and then suddenly you're like this giant new blue ocean where there's so many possibilities and, and things to explore. And from there, you, you don't know whether this matters or not, then you write about it and then you publish it and then the world seems to care. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so you mentioned these kind of like knobs or, or levers that we're pulling. And it's funny because um, I, I interviewed and talked with Trent and he kind of used this also language of levers. So yeah. what do you see as the highest leverage levers or what buttons have you found that we can push? I, I would hesitate to say whether this is works for everyone or for all projects. But, as, but what has worked for me incredibly well in the past and i've also mentioned this in the previous answer is i've i've seemingly developed um or i don't have much fear about looking weird or stupid and looking vulnerable or strange and what's helped with that is just i've just published a lot of stuff and what's helped with that process is that by writing something down and formalizing my own thoughts, I get a better understanding of it, right? And if you have to write it in a certain way that you believe someone else needs to read this and understand it, you're also learning how to talk and communicate this specific idea to new sets of people. But then after that, you have this extreme leverage by the fact is that this content exists for extremely low marginal cost. Like to publish a blog post today is it's almost it costs basically nothing and to keep it hosted costs also basically nothing. And, um, but the potential upside is so massive that like one good blog post or like one good content article can change everything, 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 everything. And that that's helped me a lot in the past where every time I, it seems to leverage itself and now people can go back still and read what I, what I wrote. So that the, the, the feeling of like, having a bias towards publishing, you know, always be publishing is like a mantra that I have, uh, even when you're afraid or, or potentially worried. Um, yeah. So yeah, just be fearless and sharing your ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think, I think part of the reason why I might not be too afraid in doing this stuff is that my mother, she was a dancer and she was frequently on stage and she, took um, us as kids to go watch theater and musicals and so forth. And she also encouraged us to participate. And I just really, really loved it. And so I never developed any kind of stage fright, really. And so I think that's part of the reason why I, I also have that attitude towards content publishing. So it's, you know, feel, feel free to publish because it's a performance, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> You have a huge background in art and we were talking about what's been happening in the NFT world and we have all these kind of creative ways to, um, I guess, funnel funding or to access funding um, like we never have before. And, and but but being, you know, with the common stack, how can we create commons or, or share this value? How do you see that we can share uh, all of this value creation to actually focus on real world issues and challenges that we're facing with the environment? Yeah, I, I, the NFT space currently is just really, really exciting. It makes me incredibly happy because this is 
this is what I've been trying to work on for the past few years is like, I believe the world will be a better place if more people can create things that people find beautiful or enjoy. And so far now it's happening and it makes me very happy. Um, that being said, I, with regards to NFTs and artists, like that's what we currently see. It's, it's the creatives that are earning from it, but ultimately the promise of this technology right from the start, starting with Bitcoin was we can now program where value, where we believe value should flow more readily in the world, whether it goes to a game creator or a musician or an artist or a coder or a writer or a nonprofit. We've, 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 we've now opened that, as you mentioned, this Pandora's box where we can program value to go where we believe it should go. So in a case of NFTs, we can broaden the potential into the future. Art is the lowest hanging fruit because that's what people are familiar with, but it can go so much broader from here where we can funnel the, the stuff, the money that's being made here in the NFT space to other beneficiaries that is not just the artists. And, you know, the artists have, they deserve it so much. You know, I'm so happy to see so many artists that have been working in the digital art space for so long, but finally earning money. So super happy for them. Um, but I also believe like the time will come where we can also build this technology to funnel it to other beneficiaries. And that that's where you try to use different kinds of economic systems. You, you, you can even be simple as just artists, uh, conservations, um, hire artists to make NFTs and split the split the funds to, you know, using something like um, Harburger tax, like the wild cards team is doing where you essentially form the NFT into a new kind of asset asset class where it's just patronage as an asset class. So there's still a lot of potential there um, to just explore how we can merge these two together to ensure we also um, fund regenerative economics. Yeah, and going along with that, I mean, whether it's NFT or speaking as well in DeFi, there's a lot of mm. people benefiting individually in that space. Um, but why is token engineering so important in leveraging these mechanisms um, for commons or cooperatives? We can use this technology or token engineering as a discipline to ensure that we don't make mistakes, right? I be, it, it's it's important that it that just the fact that it exists means that we're already asking questions to ensure that this technology is used for you know ethical purposes, um, positive pro-social purposes, you know, not to play some games of speculation and trying to see who exploits the other the most, you know, and that's what DeFi can sometimes feel like. It's this it's a game of hot potato and everyone's passing it around and trying to make the most money from other other people doing the same thing and there's definitely ways in which you can go wrong and in which it has gone wrong in the past and so that's where token engineering can help is is to use it just to art the most basic thing is just to ask questions the fact that, that we're even asking questions is how it can go wrong is a step in the right direction yeah and also questioning our assumptions 100 percent. yeah Hmm. Okay, so now I would love you to talk a little bit about uh, your book. We must take the opportunity. Um, so Hope Runners of Gridlock, what was the inspiration for this book? And tell us about the process. And, and if you want to go into the story story a bit, it's quite interesting. It's kind of like this dystopian uh, radical markets mixed with sci-fi. Yeah. Um yeah, it's uh, it's uh, as I said before, I've always been interested in systems, and a part of that is just cities. I find cities incredibly fascinating, and some of my favorite books have been where there are interesting cities. Uh, that's why I have sometimes a very deep love for things like Star Wars, because the cities in in this in the universe is just very interesting, and. I was just always fascinated by the idea of like creating cities or like imagining future cities. That's my favorite stuff in sci-fi. So I saw this image from a, a Nor I think it's Norwegian or Danish pop artist that sketched this picture um, where it's just, it's this very dystopian looking um, future. And then there's this row of cars that seems to be stuck 
and it looked like the people were weaving in and out of them. They were getting out of their cars and going into the next car. And it's just sort of this rhythmic dystopian thing. And that image just stuck with me. And, and for like a year afterwards, I kept coming back to it on periods of meditation, introspection, it just came back to me. And I kept asking questions like, what would the city look like in reality? And why was it like that? And also at that time I was getting into radical markets and it just made sense for me to explore merging this idea that there's a city with a gridlock and people live in the gridlock in the cars and figuring out how the economics work and then trying to put characters in there and asking them, you know, what do they feel like? What do they like? What questions are they asking? What matters to them? And it was like those, that those two things, like the, the, the novel economics of a new city that I really adored. And then other stuff was just related to like philosophical questions about, you know, my own journey of like finding meaning uh, in, you know, in life and so forth and finding metamodernism as like a great structural framework for how to approach the modern age, which is, you know, this, this, this battle between you know, postmodernism, which is this constant process of deconstruction, but uh, giving us some benefits from it, but opposed to modernism, which had all these grand narratives, but had problematic grand narratives where we're like, we believe we are the best and then leave people behind. Defining metamodernism to be a merger between these two and, you know, swinging the pendulum and saying, I want to feel grand narratives again, but the only way to get there is to reconstruct. So we've we've had modernism, then we deconstructed it. Now we need to reconstruct it. So merging that into a novel is what I wanted to achieve. And um, the process was really interesting because it's the first time writing something to that length and actually writing a story. So I learned a lot from doing that. It took me a year and a half to write from and going through the process, but I really enjoyed it because a part of creating for me is just enjoying the creative process itself and learning how things work and how you get to end result of a novel. Um, but I've, I'm super happy with the result, and I am still thinking about the city, even though it, uh, it was released in October. Um, so yeah, you will, you will see by the end of the book that uh, um, you might figure out that maybe there's a sequel in there. And I'm excited about continuing living in this world, yeah. And it's just got this cool like vaporwave vibes that yeah. is so suited to our time. I, I also think musically. And so I did actually create like a musical mood board for the for the novel as well, which is just like music, feelings of music and thematic music. Um, so I think it would be a dream come true if I can create this into some animation or film. Any final thoughts or words of wisdom for the community? of you know somebody will be watching this maybe they have an idea maybe there's some vision that they're holding but that they don't feel you know they know how to start or they don't feel the confidence yeah i would i would, I would say um you know the there's a bunch of us in the community that that that, that it's always open ears for open ears and open eyes for new new ideas and contributions so feel free to share Jeff's article that Griff wrote, read the inspire common stack. That was just, you know, it was just, we have ideas and we publish them. So, uh, don't be, don't be scared, but I know it's sometimes difficult just to say that as like advice is like, <laughs> but, um, but I, I think another thing to, 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 to make it easier for people is just to realize like, and this might get a bit, bit soppy and philosophical, but you know, we don't have much time to do much in the world. So just there's, there's no reason to wait. So publish. Yeah. That's a cheesy way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> just publish. Thank you so much, Simon. Yeah. We really appreciate you being with us here in the trusted seed spotlight. And thank you so much, everybody for watching. Thank we'll you. see you next time. Thank you very much.